up for an in-person virtual meeting, I think. <laughs> hey, how to go how we're back. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everyone to the first Region 7 Planning and Policy Council meeting of 2022. <laughs> We've been meeting virtually for quite some time now, almost two years. Um, so thank you everyone for taking time out of your day um, to meet with us. I know it's going to be a really um, great meeting. We have a presenter here and we'll be talking about the 2022 needs assessment as well. So thank you for joining us. My name is Kirby Fye. I work with the department. Um, I know we've all been through this. I believe everybody on the call has been through this before, but just a reminder, this meeting's being held virtually per the Open Meetings Act, um, especially with the new variant going around. We just want to keep everyone safe uh, right now, and this seems to be the best option. And every quarter we'll uh, discuss what's the best option for the regional councils. Um, so for right now, it's all virtual. Please make sure um, your your um, computers or your phones are muted if you're not speaking just to prevent any feedback from coming through um per the open meetings act this meeting is being recorded so it will be on the department website within the next day or two um, so please also state your name before you present or have any questions it's just helpful when capturing the minutes i'm going to go ahead and go through the attendance um, okay so like I said, I'm Kirby Fye with the department. Uh, we have a caller, I believe. Is that Jakarta Suggs on the phone? It is. Hello, everybody. Hey, Mark. Hey, Jakarta. <laughs> hey, Jakarta. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have Allison White, uh, Avis Easley with the department, Bartholomew Allen, uh, Butch Odom, Casey Chambers. Uh, Dr. Elian, what's your first name? It's Audrey. Hi, Audrey. Hi. We have Aaron Gillian, who will be presenting today. Jay Reed, Kayla Meadows, Cooper or Cal Bryant, Kurt Hipple with the department, Lincoln Kaufman, Lindsay Blevins. Lisa, I just see your first name. What's your last name? Last Lisa name. Smith. Uh, Hi, Lisa. Hi. Hey. Mary Neal, Melissa Rodriguez Analco. I hope I pronounced that correct. Samantha Hammonds, and then I see Scarlett and Olivia. Can you please state your names? Yes, so it's Scarlett Moldovan and Olivia Johnson. Welcome. Tom Starling and Zakaya Taylor. Did I miss anyone that um, is here and I didn't state your name? All right, I'm going to hand it over to uh, the Region 7 leadership. Hey, everybody, this is Bartholomew. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to actually on this meeting because Mary and Butch have been doing the legwork for this one um, and for the one before. I'm going to let them take over. Uh, I think Mary has to step out um, after a while, so Mr. Butch will take over. Are you guys okay with that? All right, well, Mary and Bush, it is all yours. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. We're glad to see everyone. Um, we will have some time at the end um, after the needs assessment discussion to kind of do some networking and announcements and um, just if anybody has anything, conferences or anything coming up, we can get to that at the end. Um, but first, we wanted to do the approval of the minutes um, from our last meeting. So pulling those up now. Um, so that would have been from the October um, 26 meeting, and you should have received that in an email from Butch about four days ago. Did everybody get that? Um, do we have anyone that wants to approve the minutes? Any motions? And I'll give you time to look it over if you haven't gotten a chance. <clears throat> hey, it's Tom Storling. I'll, I so move. Thank you, Tom. Do we have a second? Nick Kaufman, second. Thank you, Lincoln. Okay, 
Um, well, Kirby, we've got a full agenda today, so we're just going to kind of jump right in. Are you given the department updates today? Yes, let me pull that up. Okay. Hey, Kirby. Kirby and Avis, are you are you guys making uh, Mr. Kirk stand up? <laughs> I think he's at a standing desk. Are you in the office, uh -huh. Kurt? <laughs> no, I'm not sure. I was wanting the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, the department is really I, I, I didn't know. <laughs> they took away all our chairs, Bart. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is too much. Yeah, I'm in the office today and I'm standing up trying to get a little exercise or what counts as exercise in my life these days. So <laughs> good to I was see looking you. Out for you Kurt. I was making sure you're okay. I appreciate the concern. Thanks for thanks for looking out for me, Bart. <laughs> We all moved to virtual and they took all our chairs, Bart. <laughs> they did take a lot of things away, though. I will point that out. I went, I went downtown and I was like, there's a lot of things missing. <laughs> it looks a lot different. All right. Oh, gosh. Let me, uh, let me pull this up now. Okay. All right. So just a few things to go over since we last met in October. Um, and some of these things we'll be talking about in more detail later. Um, so the first update is the 2022 needs assessment worksheets. I shared those with the Region 7 leadership. Um, these need to be completed and submitted back to me via email on or before April 1st. Um, just please make sure to include data to support your region's identified needs, just like every year. Um, I have a link to the Fast Facts portal, um, which is just a tool that you might find helpful when gathering data for your needs. But as always, you can use um, data from anywhere you can find it, just so long as it relates to the need that you have identified. Also, another reminder, um, in case no one, in case no one, in case anyone on this call wasn't on the call in October, we do have a change in the number of needs that are allowed to be submitted. So typically we would have four needs submitted, two representing mental health and two representing substance abuse. Um, but in uh, during the legislative proposal process, the Region 2 Planning and Policy Council had submitted um, a proposal to increase the number of needs that can be submitted and Commissioner Williams took a look at that and not something that needed to be taken care of um, per legislation, um, something that she looked at and said, yeah, this is a good idea. So um, rather than forcing everyone <laughs> to come up with um, more needs, she put the option out there that every regional council and statewide committee can submit anywhere from two to six needs, just so long as um, there's equal representation for mental health and substance abuse. So either two, four, or six. Uh, the FY21 joint annual report is complete and it has been posted to the department website. I have included a link in my minutes or in my update that I will send to Butch for the minutes um, so that you can access that if you are interested in taking a look at it. The department has selected a total of 10 programs across the state to receive $6.5 million in new funding to expand mental health services for children and youth. The new state funding was budgeted by Governor Bill Lee and appropriated by the Tennessee General Assembly in the department's budget for state fiscal year 2022. In the department's announcement of funding, grantees were instructed to collaborate with community stakeholders, including local education authorities and other partners to design proposals that would have the greatest impact and address outstanding needs. The selected proposals increase school-based services and respond to the increasing need for emergency psychiatric services for children and youth. Available funding under this announcement was divided proportionally among the department's seven planning regions based on the number of youth, uh, based on the number of children and youth living in each region. So I have every region listed here and which providers were um, awarded money and um, how much, but I'm just going to discuss Region 7. Um, like I said, I'm going to send this to Butch to include the, in the minutes so you can take a look at the other regions if you're interested. But in Region 7, Shelby County, um, Tennessee Voices was awarded a million dollars to expand child care consultation with three early childhood specialist positions and three family support specialists. In December 2021, and you may have seen this um, 
in uh, announcements that were shared with your region's leadership and then shared with you via email. Um, but in December 21, the department and TenCare published the Public Behavioral Health Workforce Workgroup Report. The document contains research, data, and strategies for addressing workforce challenges in publicly funded mental health and substance use services, some of which have already been translated <clears throat> into state budget requests proposed to Governor Lee. Convened by the department and TenCare over the summer, the work group was comprised of diverse stakeholders from public behavioral health provider organizations, mental health and addiction advocacy groups, colleges and universities, and the statewide planning and policy council. Over the course of three meetings, participants identified gaps and needs in the public behavioral health workforce, developed detailed strategies for creating positive change, and authored the report for key decision makers. The report's recommendations focus on several key areas of impact, including provider reimbursement rates, licensure modifications, employee benefits and incentives, pipeline career planning, diversity and inclusion, student loan forgiveness, um, expanding internship opportunities, and communicating to potential students. Budget proposals from both the department and TenCare reflected high priority items from the work group including increased funding to allow providers to pay more competitive wages, sign-on bonuses, post-secondary scholarship, scholarships, and internship opportunities. In all, the agencies proposed $59 million in new state and federal funding to address these issues. Um, items included in Governor Lee's FY23 budget proposal will be announced in early 2022 when he delivers his annual State of the State Address, which I believe takes place on the 31st. Is that right, Kurt? January 31st? Um, and the report can be accessed and downloaded. Um, I have included a link to where you can find that. It's very interesting, um, and I'm sure you're all aware by taking a look at the needs assessment summary, workforce development has been on there for a couple years now, so this is really exciting. Um, and last but not least, the Tennessee Recovery Navigators are celebrating another successful year of delivering life-changing interventions for people living with addiction. The department is releasing a new annual report which details the program's successes despite a full year of pandemic-related restrictions. Tennessee Recovery Navigators use their own personal experience of addiction recovery to talk with patients at Tennessee Hospital Emergency Departments and try to connect them with treatment resources. The patients they see have either recently overdosed, are experiencing active withdrawals, or have presented with a substance use disorder. The Navigator's new annual report details accomplishments for fiscal year 2021, including um, increased patient interactions of 2,967, 76% of patients were placed into treatment, and four hospitals have been added for a total of 42. Now in their fourth year, the Tennessee Recovery Navigators have worked with more than 6,700 patients statewide. And some of the patients, early, or some of the program's earliest patients are in recovery themselves and are working in behavioral health as detailed in a recent video series produced by the department, which I encourage you all to take a look at. Um, it's really interesting. And I've included a link to where you can access that on our department website as well. And that's what I have. Okay, thanks so much, Carby. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, we are going to roll into our speaker, Erin. Thank you so much for being here today. She is the Region 7 Regional Housing Facilitator for the Creating Homes Initiative and is going to be telling us kind of all about that today. And so we're glad you're here. Welcome. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to share a little bit about the Creating Homes Initiative uh, program through the Office of Housing and Homeless Services. I actually have a PowerPoint that I wanted to share today. Um, and then there's a video in it as well. Is there a way we can share the sound in that video also? You know? Excuse me, sorry about that, you cut out. No, no, I'm sorry. So I was saying that I have a, a PowerPoint that I want to share today. Uh -huh. And I have a video um, in there, a small clip that I wanted to share um, on the housing. 
Uh, is there a way that we can share that sound? Yes, it should work. I believe I have it set up to do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know we tried it one time and it didn't work, but I think I know okay. how to figure it out if it doesn't. Okay, great. Um, but if you need to share it, um, are you familiar with MS Teams? Oh, I'm not. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Um, in the top right corner where by the leave option, there's a little arrow, a box with an arrow pointing up mm -hmm. top right corner of your screen. Do mm -hmm. you see it? Mm -hmm. So that'll allow you to share your document. Okay. And we'll see if the sound doesn't work. I should be able to fix it. So do I want to share entire screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So you'll click on share content. And then if you have your presentation on your taskbar at the bottom, that's going to be the easiest way to pull it up. Okay. All right. Can you see it okay? Yep. All right. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Well, um, I don't want to take too much of the time, but I do want to share um, kind of the history and where we are today and the type of housing that we want to develop uh, for individuals with mental health uh, and core disorders, particularly substance use um, disorder. Okay, so I am Erin Gillian. Uh, I'm the Region 7 Regional Housing Facilitator for CHI 2.0, Substance Use Disorder. Um, I am located at CAP Incorporated at 4041 Knight Arnold, um, right off of Getwell and Perkins. Here is my office number and my cell. Um, my email is the best way to reach me, which I will share with you later in the presentation as well. Okay, so a little bit about the history. Uh, so the Creating Homes Initiative program is about 20, a little over 20 years old. Um, it was originally established by Commissioner Williams uh, in August of 2000 to um, partner with local communities uh, such as Shelby County, Memphis, educate, inform, and expand quality, safe, affordable, and permanent housing. And you'll hear throughout this presentation where I'll try and highlight permanent housing um, because that is the goal of the CHI program. Um, and this was just in response to a lack of safe, uh, decent, and quality affordable housing. So the Creating Homes Initiative today has actually evolved from the original uh, six regional housing facilitators, which we refer to as our CHI-1 side of the house. Uh, recently, I guess about a year and a half ago, we expanded to the CHI 2.0, and that's for the substance use housing facilitators, and that is my role. I'm actually the Region 7, Shelby County, uh, City of Memphis, and I say the City of Memphis because uh, Region 7, as we know, is only uh, Shelby County and Memphis. Uh, Davidson County has its own uh, CHI 1 facilitator as well as its CHI 2. Um, we have since also expanded into CHI 3, and that's re-entry. We'll delve a little bit more into that um, further in the presentation as well. Um, just want to highlight uh, for the fiscal year 21, the Creating Homes Initiative leveraged more than $850 million to create 20,000 new housing opportunities across the state of Tennessee. So the strategies for success. The state, of, the state provides the framework, the incentives, and the regional housing facilitator. Uh, so those regional housing facilitators, such as myself, are available to agencies who provide... That's my alarm. So those... I lost my place. I'm sorry. Um, so those regional housing facilitators um, span across the state of Tennessee. And we're available to individual agencies who provide uh, treatment, uh, recovery support for those individuals who are affected by mental health and substance abuse, who want to develop housing. Um, we work with a continuum of care, 
um, usually the housing that is developed is owned and operated by local agencies, um, usually mental health service providers and affordable housing agencies. Okay. Um, emphasis is placed on developing permanent housing and I'm not sure uh, if everyone understands the definition of what we call permanent housing. So I'll go into that just a little bit. So permanent housing means that the individual can live in the housing for an unlimited amount of time, meaning they can live there forever, be it a group home, um, what have you. Um, but they don't, they can't be made to move. And what we like to refer to that time span is longer than six months to forever. And these can be uh, group homes, apartments, single family housing, um, just those kind of kinds of things in all in scattered scattered locations or multifamily, of course, would be an apartment or duplex, fourplex, whatever works best for the um, respective agency. So how it works. Regional housing facilitators work hands-on uh, in collaboration with grassroots community task force um, in each of the seven statewide mental health uh, planning council regions. Um, we work to develop, again, you'll see this affordable, quality, permanent, safe, affordable housing. That language is key because that's the type of housing that we're aiming to develop. And here shortly, I'll show you a couple of videos of the type of projects that we want to see uh, here in Shelby County. And I do think that right now we are suffering from a lack of these type of projects, whereas the um, agencies across the state of Tennessee, they are mastering it. And I, so that's why I want to show you what we mean by quality, safe, affordable, permanent housing. Um, if you're interested after this presentation, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, the CHI2 Regional Housing Facilitator, or the CHI1 who focuses on the mental health side of the house, Mr. Lawrence Wilson, um, and his contact information. I'll share that with you as well. Um, CHI2. We are located within the seven um, planning regions. Uh, we work with the HUD Continual Care as well as community stakeholders uh, with everybody who is involved in housing, even the um, city of Memphis. Uh, whoever you know wants to provide those leverage opportunities to house the population that we serve and being the individual suffering from uh, substance use disorder or mental health. Our consumer housing specialists. So our consumer housing specialists, and I believe we have Mr. Carter Sucks on the line today. Um, our consumer housing specialists really provides that link to what's available out there and can provide other resource development. And oftentimes will point you back in the direction of Mr. Wilson and myself, uh, should you be at the beginning planning stages of developing housing. But our consumer housing specialist really shows us, you know, what's out there and to, you know, help you go forward in being successful. And we'll also have her contact information as well, should you be at the space where, okay, I just need to um, place someone. Because a lot of times it's often confused that as the regional housing facilitators that we are in housing places. We are not in housing placement. We actually help agencies who provide supportive services to our um, targeted or uh, the population that we serve. So here is a video. This video here is about three minutes long. And then we'll have another one that's about three minutes. This one is geared towards um, women, women housing. And then the next one, will be for men housing. And you'll just see how um, the projects that are happening across the state of Tennessee and what we want to have more of in um, the city of Memphis and Shelby County. Hey, my name is Lindsay Crowder. I'm the women's red 
residential program coordinator here at Aspel Recovery Center, and we have just completed our new long-term permanent housing for ladies called the Kirkland House, and I wanted to have you come on in and let me give you a tour, okay? This house will be built for 12 ladies to be able to have the opportunity to live with us uh, for a long-term period of time. We're hoping that they're with us for at least six months, ideally longer. And uh, in this house, they'll be able to receive continued treatment services. They will live with the other women and learn how to incorporate all of their uh, recovery skills that they've been learning since having been here at Apple. Uh, this is one of the bedrooms, what it will look like. So in this uh, bedroom, we'll have two ladies. They'll have the opportunity to stay here. Uh, they'll be in charge of doing all of their chores and daily household routine uh, while they are employed, working full-time jobs, learning how to incorporate their new recovery lifestyle into their new life and work. And most of them are mothers, uh, how to do all those things all at the same time. While they're here, they'll still be receiving some of the therapeutic uh, opportunities that we have here in Aspel. Here's one of the closets. Since they'll be here long term, they needed some larger closets to be able to fit their new things in. And let me show you the women's restroom. They've got plenty of room since they'll be here for at least six months to store all of their things that they'll be needing. And in this room, we've got where they'll be able to do their laundry, uh, anything else that they've got going on, an extra storage unit back here so they can hold all of their things. If you want to come this way with me, I'm going to show you into our large group room. Over on this side is where they'll be able to have their house meetings, be able to do different groups with the ladies. We do a lot of different uh, life management skills, a lot of relapse prevention groups in this uh, level of care, and the ladies will be able to all sit here comfortably. And then when we're not doing groups, they'll be able to sit and enjoy themselves, their free time. Uh, they'll be able to work on different kinds of step work while they're here. Um, they could meet with their sponsors in the group room. And then over on this side, we have the kitchen area where they will be able to make all their meals. All right, if you come out this way, you'll be able to see the nice big porch. The ladies have the opportunity to come out on the porch. Uh, sit, relax, be able to spend time with each other, uh, just kind of debrief if they've had stressful days. This will be a really nice place for them to be able to do that. Awesome. So, we will try and go to the next slide. I know how to get to it. Welcome to our new RCI Sumner. We have created a home for men in recovery. As we walk in, um, we come to the living room first. This was like a facility. It was painted white. It was for handicapped adults. And we took it and made it very homey. We can next go into the dining area. We've got group tables here where we'll be doing family style dining. One of my favorite sayings is uh, on the wall, when you have more than you need, build a longer table, not a higher fence. So I guess this is our longer table. You know, thanks to Commissioner Marie Williams and her creative housing initiative, we wrote a grant um, and submitted it in February. Kind of a little late due to COVID, but we are so excited to take a facility and turn it into a home it's, we're turning it into a home for 22 men, who otherwise wouldn't have a place to live right before the holidays. So we're very excited to show you guys around. You'll come into the kitchen. This kitchen was really bland, and we uh, some of our guys came and did a backsplash here, painted. We added a little homey touch, coffee pots and things. Everybody needs coffee in the morning, right? 
Um, if you want to come back here, I'll show you our apartment for our live-in house manager. Are you guys coming out? Okay. Hey, Bill. <laughs> Bill wants to live back here. This is for our live-in house manager. Um, he actually works at Buffalo Valley during the day, so he's already familiar with treatment processes and recovery. And he will be our on-site staff person. All right, come on. We'll take a lift here and go to the living room. When I first saw this building, all I could think about was maybe some guys sitting on these couches and watching football and eating chicken wings or something. So I think this is a, a great place to call home. You have an outdoor patio and a lot of land back there. Probably will do a garden in the spring. Follow me to the group room. This is our group room. We'll be having men's groups and MRT, some therapeutic groups in here. Um, we are using utilizing partners in Sumner County for intensive outpatient mental health services and all the ancillary services anyone would need. Most people come to us with only the shirt on their back. We provide clothes, shelter, food, anything they need to get started. Then we, then we get IDs, bus passes. There's not a bus here in Sumner County, but we'll be doing transportation services, case management, basically helping them get on their feet. Well, we'll go back here to the bedrooms now. We'll turn right and go to the blue hall. We have five bathrooms here. And we have an extra laundry room. We're going to have washer and dryer facilities in here. And here's one of the bedrooms. If you want to see what it looks like, everybody's going to have a roommate. But it's just uh, a nice place to come home to. Cozy beds and a place to start off. Now, the gentleman that'll live here can stay here as long as they want to. Um, it's not, you know, six months and you have to leave. They can stay here as long as they want or as long as they need to. We'll be doing a treatment evaluation and updating those. But we also have recovery apartments in Madison. So after they have a year clean and sober, they can move on to a recovery apartment. And then we have bankers and credit repair people that come in and help them how to buy a house. We want to take people to, through the full continuum of care from jails or treatment to recovery support services, outpatient, MRT, whatever they may not may need. We're also partnering with American Job Center just down the road here in Gallatin and they're going to uh, help us match guys with jobs. They're going to work on resumes, GED, and even provide transportation to local businesses that will hire our folks. So, we'll go this way. All the rooms are pretty much the same back here. If you want to take a look. This way we have the red hallway. So, we're still getting some artwork and stuff for the red hallway. <coughs> So the comforts match the hallway that we uh, were talking about. His flashed me why I wanted to do that. I think we're going to play, you know, kickball and stuff. We're going to have a blue team, red team. We're going to have a lot of fun here because, you know, people love to have fun in recovery. When they get clean and sober, they're thinking, well, how am I going to have fun again? Well, we love to have fun. We do a lot of art therapy, yoga. Um, we have some instructors that are licensed that are coming here to do goal setting, um, meditation and yoga. MRT, uh, art therapy, experiential therapy. There's going to be a lot of services provided at this place to help people get on their feet and leave them. We'll go back to the living room. This is just my favorite room. I can't help it. A lot of the guys I work with, we've been doing this for 13 years in Madison. And people were putting up their Christmas trees this year. And they were talking about they haven't put up a Christmas tree in 10 years, in 8 years, in 15. We want that to be here when they get out of jail this weekend. And we've got some donors that are providing some presents to go under that tree. Bath sets and hoodies and things for our new guys. They're gonna be, they're gonna have a great Christmas. We've got people providing Christmas dinner, our board of directors actually. We're a nonprofit. We have a board of directors and they're providing a catered meal for Christmas dinner. So we're very excited about that. Awesome, awesome. So, 
let's see if we can start from the current slide. All right, so how do we make that happen? Um, creating those types of housing opportunities and programs, um, as we know, um, with the building and renovation costs um, and the program operating, it doesn't come cheap. Um, so we specialize as housing facilitators and assisting with collaborative partnerships and um, making you aware of the different types of funding opportunities. Um, our sister agency that we partner with, uh, THDA, uh, administers the HOME program. And the reason why I mentioned the home program and some others that we'll talk about uh, is due to what we like to call leverage funding. Um, we'll need more than one um, source of funding to build or to rehab. Um, the home program in uh, Memphis and Shelby County is uh, has actually or typically is awarded to directly to the city of Memphis and Shelby County. So agencies would need to apply directly through um, HCD, um, how the community development or Shelby County to uh, be eligible for funding. And the, for the last fund, well, the funding round that's in place right now, the minimum is 100,000 and the maximum is $750,000. The Tennessee Housing Trust Fund uh, is also another uh, funding opportunity that we can help you um, to, to round up funding for your project. Um, the Tennessee Housing Trust Fund, um, each year, that funding opportunity, um, like most, will vary uh, each year. For uh, example, this year, um, the and it's on a winter summer um, funding cycle rather than a fall spring so it comes out twice a year and the amount available on this past um, funding round was 1.7 million across the state of tennessee um, as you might imagine um, with that number of dollars it is quite competitive um, the maximum grant was 600,000 and the award was only for rental only. But in that instance, uh, you can use those funding dollars to uh, assist with your operations. Um, and we can help you to tweak or uh, perfect your uh, program if you don't already have one or if, for instance, if you have an agency in mind that you might be aware of that might be a good candidate to uh, submit for these various funding opportunities. Please keep in mind that uh, most of the funding opportunities are uh, geared towards um, households that are at or below 80% uh, AMI. If you are serving individuals that are above 80% um, area median income, um, higher points will be awarded for those proposals and applications that are uh, serving those uh, that are very in the very, very low income range. Uh, the CREATE, and here is our, um, this one here is out of the department, um, the Office of Housing and Homeless Services. It's uh, the CREATE Affordable Housing Program. Um, the department accepts these funding opportunities on an annual basis, um, and this particular funding is uh, focused for uh, individuals being discharged from the regional mental uh, health institutes, um, including those that are uninsured, to uh, assist with providing quality, safe, affordable, decent housing. 
And so you might ask, okay, well, what other funding opportunities are available through the department in the Office of Housing and Homeless Services? Well, we also have the, um, the CHI-2 program, which we um, will discuss. And you, yes, you can um, co-apply. And what I mean by co-apply is you can stack the funding um, opportunity applications. If you want to apply for creating housing, creating affordable housing or the CHI-2 and the CHI-3, which I will explain what that means here shortly, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, the Create Affordable Housing, the goals are to uh, increase opportunities for individuals experiencing mental illness or, and or core cord disorder, uh, substance use disorders, to obtain quality, safe, affordable, uh, decent housing. And good examples are those videos that we just watched. Uh, those are practically, you know, new homes that, you know, can help these individuals to focus on living a better, more productive life, meeting with their sponsors, uh, whatever type of medications or whatever they may need, but to get them back on the right track. Um, it provides, so these grants do provide um, support. They do provide support for um, operations uh, with your infrastructures, um, such as, but not limited to, your sprinkler system, your heating and cooling system, roof repair, floor repair, electrical wiring, and plumbing repair, insulation, um, things that just help you get up and running. And I think it's important to take away that one grant might help you with operations, another may help you with infrastructure, another may uh, possibly help you with uh, just the build itself. So it's important to read through those, have someone on your team that can reach out and, um, and talk to us. Um, we're here, uh, we're available, um, and we want to help grassroots organizations. Um, big or small, uh, we are definitely an equal opportunity um, resource. So the Chi Two, the Chi Two, um, if you you know have gathered already, the Chi Two is for substance use. So this is to develop quality, affordable, safe, and decent permanent housing for individuals uh, with substance use disorder. So this funding opportunity provides grant funding for the development of new construction, acquisition, rehabilitation, conversion of your infrastructure, um, ongoing operational costs for newly created housing. It also provides uh, grant funding toward your um, operational costs. Um, such as your professional fees, staffing, uh, your supportive services. So this one is sort of a one-stop shop. It can be used for basically anything you would need to get the program up and running and continue, um, continue to run. The CHI-3. CHI-3 is re-entry for individuals who are re-entering the community from prisons and jails or have been previously incarcerated. Both our CHI-1 and our CHI-2 um, housing facilitators work collaboratively on the CHI-3 initiative. Um, and of course, it's basically the same uh, to develop uh, quality, safe, affordable, decent housing for individuals who are re-entering um, our communities. Um, the grant provides funding for operational costs, that's your utility and property maintenance, um, or it can be used for your operational costs for your recovery support services, such as professional fees, staffing, and your support services. It's pretty much an um, all-inclusive wraparound um, grant as well. Um, here I have our, uh, I did mention our consumer housing specialist, uh, Mr. Carter Suggs. Um, I have her contact information here. Uh, should you want to know what is in the area right now, uh, she can, and I'm sure she'd be glad to uh, give you a little bit more information about what she does because we do work as a team. I also have our Chi One. 
a regional housing facilitator. That's Mr. Lawrence Wilson. He's with Behavior Health Initiatives as well. I have his contact number and email here um, if you're uh, assisting the population of mental health. And lastly, I have myself. I am here at Cap Incorporated at 4041 Knight Arnold, uh, Suite 300, right on the third floor. I have my cell number. Please feel free to call me or text me. Um, email is probably the best method of communication um, and the most preferred. Uh, but of course, call, text, whatever you're comfortable with, and we will definitely get you set up. Um, anybody have any questions uh, that I can answer or if you need to set up a meeting, I'm happy to um, go a little further into uh, detail. Thank you, Erin. I'll just say that um, both Lawrence and Jakarta are in the meeting today. Okay, great. Great. So. Hey, Lawrence, Jakarta. Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, hey. Aaron, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Those were some beautiful places you showed in those videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and we want to get more like that around here. We want to be more, um, when I say competitive, I mean more competitive in our application process, more competitive in our um, in our programs, um, more put more thought into um, what we're seeing come through the door. I mean, it's nice to have things rehabbed, but think about when we want a new place. I mean. Don't we all want a new home? And think about what these guys and ladies are going through on a daily basis. You know, let's try and get them somewhere um, where they can be proud to call home in their efforts of recovery. So, since I'm working on the minutes while we're doing this, let me just. So, G1 is for people with sub with um, mental health issues. Correct. G2 is substance use or co-occurring disorders, and G3 is re-entry from incarceration or previously incarcerated. You got it. Okay. You got it. Well, are there any other questions for Aaron? Sounds like a great program. Thanks for taking the time to Absolutely. Share, it, Absolutely. share it with us. Okay. Aaron, I get a chance to screenshot that last uh, your slide. Um, sure. Can you just give me your 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 email address again? Sure, it's E as in my first name, Gillian G I L L Y L E N at Cap C A A P Incorporated, and that's spelled out. dot com. Gotcha. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, um, yeah. Is does this program consider family housing for um, like he, like consider family housing? So people who have the dis, uh, substance use disorder and then maybe encouraging um, different providers to pr um, promote like family housing units as well. Right, right. That, that's a good question. Um, I'm glad you asked it. So. The question is, the answer is a yes and no. So um, I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning, um, what I was hoping, and we, this is a frequently asked question, but that's why I'm glad you asked it. So we don't do housing placement. We actually assist agencies like CAP or Behavior Health or ASPL uh, that actually assist the population of mental health and those in substance abuse. So they come up with the program, whatever they want to do. They design it. 
And that was the reason why I wanted to show those videos um, to say, you know, it's such a wide range of things that you can do for men or women or however you choose to design a program. But if you come and sit down and talk with us, if, you know, the executive director or the person you have in mind to be your program director is having issues, um, we can kind of, you know, help you brainstorm through that process. So the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, the department wants to see families together obviously, you know, but it's just those various agencies that, you know, would have to come up with that, uh, with that program design. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I, it is. Okay. It's complicated, and I guess we kind of get used to it because we do it every day. Another question is, well, you know, who's your boss? Who's your employer? Who do you work for? Because we work as a team across the state of Tennessee. But we have our own um, home agencies. Uh, so, you know, it gets tricky, but, you know, it becomes normal to us. So uh, definitely no shame in asking because it's tricky. We, I well, think we have another uh, question. Okay. Zakia has a question. You muted Zakia. Yeah, I think. Am yeah. I still muted? Am I no, still we muted? can hear you now. We can hear okay. you now. <laughs> okay, so based off the answer that you just provided, I'm just asking again for clarification. Sure. So, say for me, I work for Alliance, and this is by no means saying Alliance wants to do this, just using this as an example. Okay. So, say if I have a group of families where there's an individual who has a coordinating disorder, I'm wanting to work with you all as an organization based off a specific um, tier of your services. And um, I get um, a group of my employees who are wanting to provide uh, some wraparound services and they fit into one of those tiers. Then I can work with you to set up a program that fits a grant that fits one of your models to provide um, family housing. Is Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So you have the okay. supportive services because supportive services are key, 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 like key to the infinite power um, in the success um, of our clients. Um, okay. They got to have those supportive services. Um, and that's where it says, OK, well, the owners of the properties are usually local agencies and we're in memphis so of course we're local um okay. or um facilities that you know treat patients who have co-occurring disorders or mental health so okay. i mean if you want to develop housing and say okay well i'm going to get a fourplex and it's going to have four families and it's going to cost me seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to develop this and it's going to cost me two hundred thousand dollars a year to operate it okay. Well, you've got to come up with, okay, where are you going to get this $950,000 from and have a viable plan? Well, you can't go to one, you know, agency. And when I mean agency, I mean state or federal or local right. agency and say, okay, can I get a million dollars? Because then they're like, are you crazy? We got more people. And okay. then So in short, if I don't have that, if I don't have the funds, but I have the people who need the services, you all help me get the grant together. And get the people to provide Absolutely. the money yeah. so that Absolutely. I have the model so we can have the success. Absolutely. Okay. I think I got it. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can I make mention? This is Lawrence. Hey, Lawrence. Uh, yeah. Uh, Zakaya, uh, your Northwood Hills. Uh, apartments that came through Creative Homes Initiatives. Uh, I didn't know whether you was aware of that. Okay, um, I know a little bit about it. Um, I worked a little bit with Destiny, so yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And um, and so Mary is one of my supervisors, so yes, sir. Okay, great. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> just yeah. yes, sir. Just just trying to make sure I get it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have so much to work with this. Absolutely. I mean, he he's like the he's like the walking Bible. Like I have to keep him like so close to me. I'm like Lawrence, you know this, and, and he always knows the answer to like everything. And it could be the and most. So that's the Lawrence that they talk about. I got. That's the Lawrence they talk about. 
Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, uh, sir. I'm going to start okay. calling him D. Lawrence. I'm going to start calling him D. Lawrence. Oh, yes, wow. ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. All Thank right. you so much. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'll send you a check, Aaron. Yeah, yeah D. Lawrence. You're yeah. welcome, D. Lawrence. Any more questions? Y'all keep them coming because we like questions. We like questions. Well, they, this, I can't remember the last time we had a presentation during the pandemic. Our meetings have usually been pretty slow and uh, pretty short. So this has been a, a really good presentation with lots of news. And uh, thank you very much, Aaron. Absolutely. We'll come back anytime. anytime. OK, cool. OK, well, I guess we really should move on to our our needs assessment. Um, so I'm kind of winging this um, because we're in the open meetings uh, world, we can't move into individual rooms to talk about these things um, because we have to because when you're in teams or in Zoom and you go into individual rooms, the recording doesn't take place. So putting people on the spot, um, uh, Mary and I asked uh, Lincoln, uh, Lindsay and Allison uh, to to chair and to take some time to look at last year's needs. And what I guess I would do now is start with Lincoln because he's in the center of my um, screen. Um, so just if you, Lincoln, if you could um, maybe t talk about the needs that you, that your group did last year and whether um, we have, were any of those addressed in the, in, and should they be kept for a second year? Excuse me, um, Butch and Lincoln. Before we get started, uh, am I am I um, mistaken? But didn't we do the groups last year? Didn't we have a breakout? Are you saying the reason why we can't do it because they have to be recorded? Yeah, Kirby said we couldn't do it. Oh, Kirby. Okay. Yeah, we didn't have. That's all I need. Yeah. <laughs> now, we you all may have met outside of the regional council. I think the majority of regional councils meet again separately. Okay. So in those cases, obviously, you can do whatever you want because those meetings don't need to be recorded. But for the regional council meetings, it's just impossible to record all of the sessions. Um, I know it's it's basically the biggest downfall of the virtual option. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. I was just I, I thought we had a breakout session, but apparently it was during our regional meeting that we did a breakout session, I think. So, yeah, that, this is Lindsay. Can you all hear me? Hey, Lindsay. Hey, yeah, we did. We scheduled follow up meetings and so we had just kind of separate stuff set up and I think Butch, we probably did. I think we did it through you and we set up different rooms and broke people apart yeah. that way, but it was secondary to to this meeting. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Sounds and good. that that'll probably happen here. We don't meet until uh, 25 days after this is due uh, the next time. Um, and so you know, so let's let's just um, take a few minutes and if we say Lincoln, let's say Lincoln try to 10 minutes, uh, Allison 10 minutes, uh, Lindsay 20 minutes since you have both things for children. Um, for those of you, we have a lot of new people in the room today. Um, think about what you might want to, um, which group you might want to work with. We'll send out an email to everybody um, when uh, another whatever follow up meetings there are if if we decide there needs to be after this. So Lincoln, tell us about last year's needs assessment for substance use and um, what your thoughts are. Um, hi. Um, so this I don't want to take credit for this completely, but um, John Jackson was the originator of one of the ideas that we had basically um, kind of safety net style outreach center. Um, one that could be, um, uh, you know, somewhere in Midtown, downtown, or really like whatever location y'all think would be most advisable, but um, an outreach center to serve the gap between um, people being able to get into detox and just seeking help. Um, it could be manned by um, certified, or not manned, but um, volunteered or even have you know, a, a small group of employees of uh, certified peer recovery specialists and maybe 
a small clinical staff or something like that, but basically something to um, something to um, cater to, you know, people in between the gap of, of really needing um, some sort of some sort of treatment or even just attention, even if that's like peer recovery, uh, tr uh, you know, attention or and getting into like being like a detox program or one of the local services that are available. So that's that's kind of been something that's been proposed for the last two years and on top of that like as, lo as long as i've been around um more detox beds have always been on the table but there's also the newer um facility that we're looking at um the alliance facility on some avenue um, i just wanted to throw that in there because it's always been there since i've been around um but um i really am a big advocate of john jackson's idea that we kind of uh, expanded upon for the last uh, couple of years about having a facility that um, is available for people um, that, you know, have nowhere to go in between wanting detox and not being able to get in detox because of the detox situation, as well as like whatever, whatever other, other uh, mental health or even substance use disorder type um, issues that just aren't um, immediately um, you know treatable or even like some place for someone to go and like one one thing i know is that a lot of certified peer recovery specialists often just get in touch with me asking for opportunities you know and um and 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 what they can do like even on a volunteer level not to mention on a an employment level but just as a as volunteers and just to get their their hours as certified peer recovery specialists was there anything um i know butch you worked really closely with me on uh <laughs> helping me with this is there anything you wanted to add to that um so so our our two needs were more detox beds and this this peer peer centric program that that y'all wrote up you know i think that if um there's enough people from alliance on this call that they could take over the meeting if they wanted to but i i think i saw michael sims's uh name there uh michael how many are y'all going to be able to increase beds with that new facility and and what sort of the when do y'all think that that will open hey good, happy new year everybody but it's good to see you good to see you <laughs> good to see your little icon there man <laughs> I, i'll turn it on for you here i go yeah <laughs> um so yes we are excited about the new facility is is still uh good ways off maybe two years unfortunately um, the plan is we're still in talks about increasing the beds there we, we haven't finalized everything but that's one of the conversations we are having um, so <clears throat> once we finalize the plans for the new facility get with Janice and Laurie and sit down and have a conversation with the state about it then we'll know more details but we're just still in early talks right now and am I right that y'all are still um, socially distanced in your room, so you're still at two per room instead of three per room? Yes, currently we're still at two per room. Um, hopefully once we get some more nurses, as everybody knows, nurses it has been uh, just a huge shortage. Uh, once we get more nurses, um, then I would take a look at opening all, all our beds back. But if someone needed, Lincoln calls me and say, hey, Mike, I, I really need to get someone in. I was, okay, let, let's just make it work. So that'll go up to 27. We're at 18 right now. Um, I will cave for 20 in certain situations, but that would take us back to 27 beds. Okay. Thanks a lot for that. Um, so Lincoln, I hear you. You you would be um, uh, you'd be advocating for keeping the first one for sure. Um, and um, so um, so. I just asked Lincoln to to chair this committee because you know he works he works with us in the coalition and um, and so when we get together um, Lincoln will just uh, gather that so the question is um, and maybe we come back to to this but if there's any ideas that people have that might be a, another need there's nothing that says we can't just submit the ones we did last year um, but if there's any other uh, need around adult substance use disorder 
then be thinking about that and, and maybe shoot that to Lincoln. Um, I'll, Lincoln, maybe you can put your email in the chat. Sure. Sure. OK. Hey, Allison. <laughs> oh. can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. <laughs> Sorry, I, I am recovering from COVID, so I'm not <laughs> really all here. Um, oh, wow. I'm so sorry. Well, it was mild. I'm vaccinated and boosted, so thank goodness. Um, okay, so when I pulled up, so we did we just have one for ment adult mental health? I thought we had two, but maybe I'm thinking of the year prior. Um, so what we had talked about, and is Kevin on the call from the fire department? Anybody know? I have not. He is. I have not seen him on the. He's okay. not in there, to my knowledge. So Kevin was. Okay, so Kevin's on our committee, and um, he um, was instrumental in this. And this was ba Our need was based on. Let me pull it up. Hold on a second. So it was based on um, increased funding to continue and expand the care, which is crisis assessment and response to emergencies team model in Memphis. Um, as well as to conduct research into its sustainability for expansion throughout the state. So um, CARE, the, the CARE model is a multidisciplinary team and it's um, uh, it's a counterpart to CIT and it was, um, Alliance did have that program. I don't think they do anymore, but it's- um, We still do, Alice. What now? We still do. You're still funding that? Yeah, we so how that works is is it started about three years ago. Um, it was a grant through the state, and we decided with collaborate with Memphis Fire, Memphis Police, uh, Memphis Fire, adding having the paramedic for the medical piece, uh, CIT of course, MPD, and ourselves for the uh, clinical uh, piece. <clears throat> so we are still collaborating together um, to make sure we're answering those nine one one calls out in the field. So. It goes through uh, fire communications and or can come through our crisis center and we dispatch the care team to the corner to someone's house wherever wherever they're located so are you dispatching your your mobile crisis team or are you dispatching a um it's the care special, team. specialized person it's the care on, team huh it's the care team that goes oh it's the care team so it's not yeah. mobile crisis okay good Price so how long do you all, I mean, I know this is a long question, you probably don't know it, but I mean, how long do you all, well, first of all, how many social workers or behavioral health clinicians do you have on the care team currently? Two. Two? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to guess that they're pretty busy. Yeah, we would like to see them busier, <laughs> but, but they oh, are. Oh, really? Okay. So, so, so which is interesting because it's such a need out there because, you know, with Methodist, you know, we have five adult hospitals in the Mid-South and um, they're just overwhelmed with, of course, our psychiatric emergencies that are being seen in the ED, um, especially now with COVID, the EDs are just slammed all the time. And so, and then it takes a while for mobile crisis to get out because all the other hospitals. So um, it's, I certainly see this as it's still a need. Um, I don't know how doable it is for us to continue to ask for that, but I definitely think it's a need and I'm not sure why it's not, why your two people aren't being as utilized as they need to be. Sounds like they need to be utilized more. I, I think one of the issues, uh, and uh, Kevin and I have always, and Officer Lash have always said, one of the key issues is just getting that communication out to everyone that this is what the care team for and that's in-house that's even in in the fire department that's even in uh, mm -hmm. the department, you know saying hey guys we are here dispatch us if it's a behavior health call and you know they're so big sometimes communication just doesn't go to the right person uh, <clears throat> but we worked on that tirelessly uh, I, I, we have seen an increase in per month volume um, and we are looking to expand the days we, we want to go 24 7 to catch a lot of those calls overnight and um, weekends overnight. Are y'all funding that through a grant that you got? So we initially funded it through the grant, but right now we just eating the cost. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's what I thought. So, yeah. I mean, you know, as a team, we can certainly think about whether we want to keep this in the needs assessment or do we want to completely go a different route? I mean, it's really up to us what we decide to do. Um, 
definitely think there's a need for it, but if we need to move on to something else, anybody have any suggestions? So, Mr. Michael, uh, I'm just wondering. So, after after going back and um, and talking about this last year, uh, the whole goal was to expand it, make sure we kind of uh, become the model for across the state. We we wanted the care team to be that thing uh, that we could uh, use in ever in every sector of Tennessee. Uh, is it is it your opinion that um, we don't need a a, a larger component to the care team now we just need to focus on what we have or what are you thinking um so i have had conversations with others across the state and they have asked me how did you all do that that's that's unique i think that would be something we would like to use in our city but that was just that and that, that was it that was the end of the conversation i, I think it would be helpful uh, across the state um I know it works best in metropolitan areas like Memphis, Nashville, but what about the smaller, smaller rural areas? How would that look for them? <clears throat> so, so, so the one okay. care team that, that we do okay. have is that large enough for Shelby County? No. Okay, so, <laughs> so, and 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 I'm glad you said that because the reason why we put that, uh, and Allison, correct me if I'm wrong. The reason why we put that on our needs is because we wanted to increase. Uh, the size of the care team force for the entire uh, county. Uh, and and from what Kevin was saying and what you're saying as well, um, our care team is small and Shelby County is large. And so we wanted to increase that, 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 that um, the service that we could provide. And so I guess the, it's, it, it'll be at the, uh, the council's discretion. If we want to keep that from the perspective of uh, wanting to increase the care team size, so what I'm hearing is that there's very few on the team. So maybe with an increase of the team, there's more ability to go and communicate to our local fire departments and police, you know, and making sure the word is getting out to everyone. Because I, I'm going to tell you, I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me, obviously, but our EDs are, um, we contract all of our method adult hospitals in the county. Um, we contract through Alliance. You guys uh, are our mobile crisis people. And so, I'd have to get the numbers, but they're, they're pretty busy, especially university. Um, so yeah. I know that they're busy and dealing with psychiatric um, and mental health consumers in our in our emergency department. So and it's not for a lack of consumers out there that need it. it it's very needed. So, I mean, again, I, that's just we could certainly switch up our need or, or keep this one and see if it goes anywhere or. So I am trying not to be biased, but I would say we need it. <laughs> I definitely think we need it for sure. Um, just so Mr. Michael, if I can be so bold, uh, and Ms. Allison, if you're okay with this, I think we need to recruit Michael. I think Michael and Kevin together on this particular aspect, I say we keep it, uh, especially oh. since we can add the amount of needs um, to both the mental health and the substance abuse component uh, per Commissioner Williams. Uh, I say we keep it, and if uh, if we need to, maybe tailor it, especially with your with your expertise, Mr. Michael and Mr. Kevin. Uh, maybe we can tailor it to either get more money or or actually start a second uh, care team or expand it. Uh, so, uh, Miss Allison, if you're okay with that, I I vote to keep it and maybe alter um, uh, alter it somewhat to kind of fit our needs. Okay. So, Mr. Michael, you're on the team. I appreciate you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> appreciate do, it. I appreciate do, it. <laughs> so, as far as mental health and adults, do we want to keep one or do you want to add another one? I mean, have we all seen, I mean, we've seen lots of needs since COVID, but um, do we see any other need? I know, is Jakarta on the line? You there? I have another need after Jakarta yes, speaks. Oh, because I think year before last, we worked on was it transitional or, or emergency housing for families? I think we worked on that a couple of years ago. Did children. So. We did uh, a need last year. I do not remember. <laughs> I think we did. And I think we kept it for two years, actually, because we had talked about um, families um, who are just right That's now. Right. You, 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 you know, you're having to split up families and shelters and emergency yeah. housing because you can't, you know. And so yeah, that's, the, that's the biggest issue that I have even now. So yeah, so that could be certainly something. I mean, we've been you, we've used it a couple of times before, but yeah. it can't hurt to put it back in. Or do we want to look at 
possibly a set, another need. It's not that. I mean, that one's still a, a huge need here. So I have a suggestion. Um, I like uh, the that, like I say, we keep it. Uh, but I wanted to propose a, another need. Uh, I may have said it before. Um, um, if there is a way to actually create some type of uh, alert uh, that goes out over the phones and the airways once a person with a mental illness is uh, missing or walks away from a group home, uh, some places use the silver alert. Uh, some states have used the silver alert, uh, which is for the elderly. Um, but it would be nice to have uh, an, an alert, uh, an alert, um, at least for uh, at least for a law enforcement or someone who is knowledgeable um, that this person is living with a mental illness uh, or substance abuse and that they are missing. Um, maybe kind of tailor it. Um, the, maybe even tailor the silver alert or maybe a green alert. I don't know. Um, having been over at a couple of different places, uh, people walking away is big. It's dangerous. It's scary. Uh, and it would just be, it would be nice. I, I would hate to ostracize any of the people that walk away, um, but maybe just a heads up of some sort um, that we can kind of tie it into when someone walks away. So how would that be different from what they currently have? Because I know even in Memphis, I get on Facebook, I'll see alerts, you know, silver alerts, somebody walked away from a group home or whatnot. Oh, how so the silver alerts do work for the group homes? If you're not if you're under the age of what is it, 55, 65? Oh yeah, I've seen people who are not elderly um, on there for um, whether it's a, a disability and they walked away from a group. Am I the only one that's been seeing that? Maybe on Facebook too much, but um, oh, no, no. I haven't seen. So that. I've that's seen I've seen those alert. I mean, on Facebook, I, I don't get like the alert on my phone like I do an Amber alert, but I do see the alerts that like MPB might put out or a um, news station is reporting. Um, for people who are not elderly but do have a disability, maybe they walked away from a group home. Okay, well, they're without their medication or you know something. Then take mine off the if, if, if that exists. Hey, already, I mean, I also follow a lot of Mississippi news places, so it might be hard to. Well, um, with me working in a group home, we have to immediately report to the police department, and then we see it on the news. So okay. is that what you all speaking of? Yeah, that'll be. Uh, if that so I've seen I've maybe. seen those clients on the news when we've had to report, and we we've, we've had to. It's been mandatory when we haven't been able to get in touch with next of kin. Okay, that's great. Well, scratch mine then. Oh, but were you were you asking for a statewide alert system like uh, on the phone, like an Amber Alert? Is that what you were asking for? That would. That would be great. Uh, I was I was thinking more just for the region. Sorry, I had a call. I'm oh, okay. Um, but yeah, if, if we have systems in place, I am 100% okay with that. I okay. I didn't know of any. Uh, we've had people walk away before, um, and I mean, we didn't hear anything on the on the news. Um, maybe it's because you know, a smaller agency. I don't, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, but if it exists, I am happy. I am 100% happy. Hey, Bart, this is Lindsay. So I actually, as you guys are talking, looked up Tennessee um, and what the criteria is for a silver alert. And it's got a couple different criteria. Um, one could be that they're, you know, age 60 or older whose whereabouts are unknown and are in danger because of their specific age or mental health condition, physical disability. Criteria two could be a person of any age who suffers from a case of dementia, a uh, physical impairment. A uh, number three is a person of any or whose age is reported missing, who's 18 or older, um, due to intellectual disability, developmental, or physical. Um, that one for 18 or older doesn't say anything specific about mental health, but mental health is listed in some of this criteria. Um, let's see. Uh, and it says that local law enforcement shall enter a report. Um, based on all that information within four hours of verification. Okay. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff on here. So I can, um, and you just, I just Googled literally silver alert for Memphis, Tennessee, and you could get onto the link that it talks about this, but it's Senate bill Excellent. number 102 that covers all of it. Excellent. Thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Scratch my.
But I think it's 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 not common knowledge, I think, for people to use a silver alert for that. I think we just assume it's for the geriatric population, right, who've got dementia or something like that and wander away. I don't think people typically think about using it for something different. And and I don't think, Kirby, just to kind of piggyback on that, I don't I don't think the civilian population issues the, 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 the alert, do they? We don't say I want to do a silver alert, do we? Well, I mean, it's the it's the law enforcement that determine which which category it falls into. Is that I'm right? I'm pretty sure the report would be made right to the police department, okay. and then they would decide from there. Correct? Yeah, that's I, my understanding. Yeah, that's what I would think. Okay. Well, skip me though. Yeah, I mean, it says I'm, something I'm, on I'm, here, Bert. I would read part. that. I think it. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm reading it now. Yeah, it very specifically says that law enforcement request requests the alert, and it's got a lot of verbiage, but it's a couple pages long um, and might kind of give some clarification, but it might be good for us to kind of have some conversations around it and we can, you know, see what the community really knows about that. Okay with that. Okay. Well, Allison, thank you for your work and um, uh, COVID's really giving us a new definition of what mild is, right? <laughs> it can well, still kick it was mild, but it didn't feel mild. <laughs> it felt like a bad sinus infection, but th I had three three bad days that turned the corner. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, but I guess it was mild. It's certainly mild compared to what other people are uh, are experiencing. So I'm very lucky. With that. Thank you. Let me do one little quick bit of housekeeping. Um, I think uh, we have... Um, as we were going through our discussions, um, I added six names who weren't here at the beginning. So if you if you haven't heard your name called, then you're not on the list. But here's the six new ones. There's Ashley Neal, Jasmine Brown, Lawrence Wilson, Michael Sims, Albert Richardson, and Robin Butterfield. And I think that with those names that uh, Kirby went through at the beginning, that's I think that's everybody about 30 people here today, so good, a good meeting. And Lindsay, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the children's stuff? I can. And sorry, my camera, I don't know, I'm on my phone. My computer kept giving me an error, so um, I apologize. But, but yeah, so because the Children's Committee has historically been smaller, Hint, hint, I encourage anyone to join this committee. Um, we do both the mental health and the substance Please. use um, uh, needs for Region 7. But what we came up with last year in regards to mental health was, and I think we've asked for it for a couple of years, um, mm -hmm. was the establishment of some sort of community walk-in center for youth and their families to gain access to mental health services or resources without the need to go to a medical ER or a psychiatric hospital um, to get an assessment done. You know, Youth Villages does in this area mobile assessments, but with COVID, it's definitely changed some of the dynamic. A lot of things are virtual. Um, sometimes it's just a phone assessment versus an in, you know a face to face virtual or in person assessment. Um, and it can be quite intimidating for families. And so um, we put some some data in this, you know, for the adult population, obviously for Shelby County Alliance has their walk-in center. So an adult can go in, you know, 24 seven to access services, meet with clinicians um, and really get, get some wraparound services established for them. And that doesn't exist here. Um, there are some crisis walk-in centers for children, I think, in Middle Tennessee. I think Davidson County might, ha might have some. I don't know if East Tennessee ever rolled out anything, but I think it was maybe Mental Health Cooperative who've who's done something. Um, so we just put some data in here um, regarding that um, specific need that we saw from last year. And like I said, I think it might have been the past two years that we put that in there. Uh, yes, I don't know if you guys want to have conversations about mental health before we move into like the substance use one. Does anybody have any thoughts? I think it was just me and you and Susan and Marta. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still game. <laughs> but 
Butch, if you're talking, you're on mute. Oh, I'm on mute. This is the key. No, no you, you are. I hear you. I just saw but Butch's lips moving, but I couldn't hear oh. him. Okay. Yeah, and people people wish that was the case more often. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had. Um, well, they're not on anymore, but um, we have a couple of coalition members who are in their 20s that might might have had something to say about some of their scene needs. Is, are Olivia and Scarlett still on the line? Yeah, we're here. Okay. Hey, hey guys. Thanks for coming to the meeting today. Um, um, and y'all might want to more address youth um, substance use since y'all are working with the coalition. But um, if you want to participate more with this group, uh, working with Lindsay might be a good, good, good place for y'all. Just, hey, cool. just say. Also, happy birthday, Butch. Oh, thank you. <gasps> happy birthday! <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday! I'm so okay. Stupid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Lindsay. Lindsay. That's okay. Um, well, and the other thing too, I can't see everyone who's on. Is there anyone from Youth Villages? I know the last several meetings we've had, we hadn't had any representation from them, and they're one of the biggest voices, I would say, or service providers in the Shelby County area. Um, and I'm just, I'm not sure. I mean, it would be helpful, I think, if we, if they were engaged in some of this stuff too. They might know something that we don't know. So, so we have Natasha Bonner as one of our uh, people and Shartidra Gracie. So Shartidra doesn't work for Youth Villages anymore. I know that. I know Natasha does. Is she on today or is she just on our? No, roster? she's just on our list. Um, but let me, but I don't have her email address. I don't have an email address for her, so she's not getting the emails. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't we have a uh, didn't we have someone from Shelby County Schools on our on one of the committees at one time, or they uh, were a part of the Shelby County School Council? Or did we I invite? I feel Simba like someone? um oh, what was his name? Of course, you asked me, and I can't remember. He was over the um Shelby County Schools um like social workers. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, uh, and, and the reason why I'm saying that because I think, uh, Lindsay, you're always holding it down, but I, I, I think that we probably want to start recruiting some more uh, people uh, from Shelby County Schools and from these villages to help us out. Because I'm not knowledgeable enough. I mean, I did. I, I started off in, in children, but I'm not knowledgeable enough to, to help out with children uh, and the issues that they're having in the mental health and substance abuse right now. Well, and I've got contacts at both places. Maybe I'll just, I mean, I think what we're going to probably have to do, at least for us specifically in the children and youth stuff, is maybe set up a secondary meeting. And I can try to recruit in the meantime and see if I can get, you know, a handful of people in the room from a couple different agencies, you know, the school districts, um, potentially youth villages and all that sort of stuff, and see if we can kind of brainstorm together um, and look at some needs that we might have. Yeah, that, that sounds good. But I can, in the meantime, I, I think share at least to, for this group what our substance abuse one was um, for children and youth. So at least this group is aware. Um, and, and this is another one that I think that we've asked for for the past couple of years um, was establishing a very specific substance use prevention program within Shelby County Schools. Um, you know, we've got a lot of um, data surrounding kind of school expulsions. You know, Shelby County ranks 300% higher in school expulsions than the rest of the state, many of them due to alcohol and drug related offenses. You know, we've got lengthy suspensions, we've got high dropout rates, um, which also leads to uh, either continued use or, or use of, um, of substances. Um, there's also a lot of data around um, the increase in students using like vaping products. So not even just, um, you know, illegal substances, but legal for above 18, you know, they're getting their hands on. So really, really having some education around that. Um, 
campus in the schools so so parents and and kids don't have to look to external resources uh, for support in that area um you know there are a, uh, there have been in the past i should say some um, outpatient services for substance use programming, you know, intensive outpatient and things like that. But it's definitely harder to come by than some of the adult services that we've found. And so, um, so that need to be put for last year. And I, we were specific for Shelby counties, um, but obviously we all know there are the municipalities as well um, that have districts within Shelby County that um, have seen an increase in a substance use over the last several years. And oh, that's what I, we got. <laughs> well, I forgot to ask this of Allison, but Allison and Lindsay, if y'all could put your contact information in the chat so that um, people who might want to reach out to, to work with you um, specifically uh, can do that. Where's the chat on Teams? I should know this. Uh, oh, conversation. The, okay. The, the little uh, at the very top, the, the little thing that looks like a comic book. Oh, I got uh, it. I got it. I got it. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay. So Butch, I mean, that's okay. that's basically the two that we had from last year. Um, I'm also a part of the statewide children's committee. And just to kind of get your guys's, um, just to give you more information, I should say, um, there are some statewide needs that have been thrown out there as well. Some similar to what we had in Region 7. Um, we had talked about expanding, um, again, the... Um, crisis assessment, stabilization, walk-in centers um, for the children and youth populations, um, potentially in addition to some CSU beds that we have for adults. Um, we talked about, which I think actually somewhat went through. I know that there's, you know, Kirby talked about some funding that Tennessee Voices is having. And when I talked with them, um, separately Tennessee Voices, that is, you know, they're, they're establishing you know, some screening for um, for younger children, you know, school based services, pediatric partnerships, et cetera, through Tennessee Voices that they're working on through some of the grants that they got. And that was one of the needs that we talked about, you know, making sure that we are catching them when they're younger, um, you know, birth up to age eight um, for early intervention and prevention services um, before they get too old. Um, we also put for substance use um, for an increase uh, access to home-based substance use services for mothers with young children. So this kind of goes hand in hand. We're talking about, you know, wraparound family services. When you've got a parent who is in crisis, whether that's for a mental health emergency or, you know, substance use, we're having to divide up, you know, those families. And so part of what we put on here was increasing services. So, um, so we don't have to remove the children from the home or we can move them all together for services. Um, and then the last thing that we put on here in regards to substance use was, um, providing access to the more rural area. So obviously that doesn't necessarily, uh, rural <laughs> does not meet qualifications for Memphis or Shelby County, but you know, that is something that we put on here is making sure that, you know, children in the rural parts of Tennessee have access to intensive outpatient services, whether that's in person, um, or potential virtual options to address, uh, substance use issues. So those are some of the statewide children initiatives that we submitted for last year. Thanks, Lindsay. You're 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 one of our rock stars. Um, is there um, are there any questions of Lindsay? And I am putting my information in the chat too right now. Um, so if you're interested in, you know, uh, participating in our secondary meeting or being added to the list, um, so we can kind of take a deeper dive into this, I'll put my email address on here so y'all can reach out to me. Well, thanks, Lindsay. Uh -huh. um, let's see. 
So are there, um, I guess we're getting close to the end of our, our um, uh, meeting. Um, are there any announcements that the, uh, or any, we call it lightning round here at Church Health, but are there any, um, anything that anybody wants to address to the whole group today? Hey, Butch, it's Tom hey, Starling. Hey, Tom, good to see you, man. Hey, I was just going to um, let everybody know or perhaps just remind folks that one of the big public policy issues that's probably going to be fought uh, this session is between um, the docs in the state, uh, specifically some of the psychiatrists, but other docs and um, some of the nurse practitioners that want to kind of increase the scope of their practice um, by working more independently without the oversight of, of a physician. Um, of course, you know, this does several things. Uh, number one, it, it uh, helps with the workforce shortage. Um, I think there's only 30 states that have, or 30 counties uh, that have a psychiatrist. And um, I know that HCA hospitals, the hospital association, AARP, uh, the Rural Health Association, they're all very much for this. Um, but, you know, the doctors and the medical association, uh, they certainly uh, will, will um, they have the legislators ear a lot, um, but this is going to be an interesting thing to watch. And I'm not saying that we need to take a stand on, on that because we probably all work with um, uh, medical directors and psychiatrists um, and uh, I, I just kind of wanted to, to remind you of, of, of that. And then um, another thing that I heard that is coming, but I haven't seen much about it, is that for involuntary commitments, um, that uh, the second signature uh, might be a nurse instead of a doctor when it comes to involuntarily committing a patient to a, uh, a psychiatric hospital. And uh, there's some debate about that. Um, you know, and, and, you know, taking that away from the docs or, um, uh, you know, what, what the person's qualifications are to sign off on removing somebody's autonomy and institutionalizing them. Uh, but those are, are two very delicate uh, things uh, that people are going to come out with sledgehammers. So kind of kind of be looking for those and it might be an interesting session. I know that um, in our um in our state, and if, if and it's if you're doing it correctly, um, nurse practitioners have to have 20% of their charts reviewed by by a physician, and every chart with a scheduled drug on it. And they're not allowed. Um, I don't think there's they're not allowed yet to do like Suboxone and stuff. And so, just even cutting that 10% back to that 20% back to 10% would, you know, it's just, it's hard to find people willing to supervise. Because it's because it's a lot of work. If if you're if you're going to do it the way the law is written, it's a lot of work. So I think there's room for for them to to do some things. But yeah, docs don't like them. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Tom. Tom, that's that's the butch by May. Uh, Tom, that's great information because the majority of the involuntary commits we use so many of them, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> moving that second signature from a doctor to a nurse is going to be a huge fight. <laughs> Huge. So, wow. I, I think you're right. I heard somebody say, well, wouldn't you want the smartest person in the room uh, signing off? And I thought, well, they may be the most educated, but educated. I know a lot of super smart nurses. <laughs> I agree. Like, that doesn't mean so, the smartest in the room. Just okay. That, that, that's <laughs> right. That's right. So, I, I don't know. Uh, sometimes right. lots and lots of education does not equal smart. So, yeah. Anything else, Lindsay? Do y'all have any free trainings coming up? Yeah, so we and Kayla's on too. Kayla's um, took my job as the director for business development as I've moved on to some other things. I don't know if Kayla. I'm back. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, we do. So we're still going to do our once a month free CEU workshop. Um, I'm still waiting to finalize some things from February, but I can email this group, you know, any information about any free CEU things that we have coming out. I don't know if anyone heard if um, 
there's going to be an extension on allowing LPCs and LCSWs to continue doing a majority of their CEs virtually. Do you does anyone on this call have an update on that? I know there was some concern that it was all going to have to be done in person, but I don't know if that's changed again, given the new variant. I haven't heard anything and I also haven't seen anything come specifically to me from the board okay. uh, saying anything. OK, well, we'll continue, you know, offering them virtually, you know, either way. So I'll when I have February finalized, I'll send that out, but it will be one Friday a month every month for all of 2022. And if you send that to, to me because I blind copy everybody for this meeting, I can I can get it out to the membership. OK, sounds good, Butch. Thanks. Sure. OK. And speaking of speakers, I know we still need one for our April 26th meeting. If anybody's interested in presenting on their yeah. program or anything mental health related. And I think we also need to make sure that we. Uh, yeah, let us know. I think we need to make sure we schedule a time um, for our committees to meet. That we can be ready for our yeah. next uh, April first of the deadline. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Well, it sounds like I need to just go find myself a committee. So <laughs> I'm going to let me. I have several folks for you that I can ah. join your efforts. Lindsay, yeah, this is so Lisa. Cool. I'll be on your committee. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> So I'll pull some people together, but so I don't know if I need um, I'll, I'll get some people together and I will schedule something and I will make sure that you guys have the needs. The only thing that we'll need to know is we have to make sure that they're even. So if we're adding any and I don't think that Kirby, correct me if I'm wrong, when we say we need to have even numbers um, of mental health and substance use, we don't have to have even numbers between child and adult, do we? No, there's no requirement at all. It's whatever your region um, sees where there's more needs, really. So it could it could be all children, it could be all adult. It's really up to you all. Okay. So we'll just need to be communicating, you know, if we're adding any in any category to make sure that everything actually is all even before we submit all that stuff. So we might want to, um, you know, me. The, the leadership committee for, you know, region seven and then, you know, Lincoln, myself and Allison, so I'll get back together to make sure that we have the right number being submitted. Um, but I'll make sure that the child adolescent group meets together and I get you all something. Kirby, do we so need Kirby, to have. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, Kirby, do we, need to, <laughs> do we need to have some sort of um, uh, guidance from the membership? that allows the sort of our executive committee and our chairs to finalize the needs assessments? So typically what um, regions do, because no regional council meets again before the needs assessments, everybody ha is kind of in the same boat. Um, typically what regional councils do, and everybody does it differently, there's some regions that actually put together like a survey and send it out like through like, um, What's that one? Is it like Survey Monkey or something? It's called the. So sometimes they'll send it out to their council members, and they can go in there and click on the needs, like if they agree on it or not. Or you can just send out an email and ask for a response by a certain date, and go from there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other announcements? Um, I believe it'll be in April, if I'm correct. Um, you may want to think about adding to your agenda um, uh, elections because um, the term, as as uh, Bart uh, mentioned, his term will end um, the end of June, and so that will present an opportunity for. Um, a new chair and then uh, the vice chair to move up to the chair position if um, uh, that is going to be possible. 
Um, and then, um, so just keep in mind those elections um, that we uh, did you guys with me on team tonight in response? No, that's a lot to take place. Have that information into um, uh, Kirby, and she passes that along to me so we can start that the process. Um, any questions on that um, while we're on this call as for selections in that process, or any questions about how that works? Because um, Kirby and I can answer that for you if, if we need to today. If not, and there are any questions, uh, can I wait to? Thanks, Avis. You're welcome. And if you all have any questions after the meeting, can I wait to chat to me and Kirby about that? Thank you. Okay. Any other, <clears throat> excuse me, any other announcements? Mary, are you driving? <laughs> no, I'm sitting. Because you're pretty intent me. on the phone there if you're driving. I don't <laughs> want to be on the road. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I get, you know, if there's no further business, um, I guess we, do we have to have a motion to adjourn or can we just, we have to have a motion to adjourn or can we just say bye? What do you, what do you, what is it? Happy Barb? not, I Happy motion birthday. to adjourn. <laughs> okay. So Lindsay's uh, motion to adjourn. Anybody want to second that? I seconded. Second. Who seconded it? Zakia. Okay, thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 And if aye. you're opposed, if, if you're opposed, don't say anything. <laughs> stay on. Bye-bye. Okay, y'all. Take care. We'll see you in a month. Happy birthday, Bush. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.